I've got another really fun one for you today in this video. In this video we're going to put together what we've done in the last two videos, which consisted of deriving the Dirac Lagrangian and by extension the Dirac equation from group theory, and then deriving the Maxwell Lagrangian from the Maxwell equations. Specifically what we're going to do is we're going to go through the set of steps required to derive the Lagrangian of quantum electrodynamics, the most successful quantum field theory ever, and arguably the most successful physical theory ever proposed. Having made a prediction that has been confirmed by experiment to a larger number of significant figures than any other physical theory known. The basic idea of how this is going to be done here in this video is we start by looking at the Dirac Lagrangian and we notice a global U1 invariance that it has. And we ask the question, what happens if we upgrade that global U1 transformation into a local transformation? Well, obviously it's not invariant, you'll see why, but exactly how we modify the Lagrangian density to make it invariant is extremely intriguing. Specifically, it involves introducing a new four-vector field, a field that must transform under these local U1 gauge transformations, I guess saying local and gauge is redundant, but whatever. The point is that in order for the Lagrangian density to be invariant, this newly introduced gauge field must transform under these U1 gauge transformations in a manner that's identical to the U1 gauge transformation of the four vector potential from electromagnetism. So what that tells us is that it might be a good idea to try doing the following. If we take the coupling that results from this process between the vector potential and the Dirac spinners as the interaction part of the Maxwell-Lagrangian, and then just add in the kinetic term for the electromagnetic field, then we arrive at an action which consists of a kinetic term for the Dirac fermions, a mass term for the Dirac fermions, a kinetic term for the electromagnetic field, and a coupling between this four-vector potential, which is the electromagnetic field, and the Dirac fermions that happens to be completely U1 gauge invariant. In fact, it's the simplest theory that has all these elements in it that is gauge invariant under this symmetry group. And what experimentalists have found is that this Lagrangian that we'll get, the Lagrangian of quantum electrodynamics, has passed every single experimental test that it has ever been subjected to. So it is clearly the correct Lagrangian density for quantum electrodynamics. It passes experiment, which in physics means everything. Now here follows the math portion of this video where I explain the actual technical details of deriving the particular form of the quantum electrodynamics Lagrangian density. In a previous video, I explained how to derive the Dirac Lagrangian from group theory, and therefore the Dirac equation from group theory, because it simply is the equation in motion associated with that Lagrangian. In that video, I worked in natural units. In this video, I'll be working in MKS units. The Lagrangian derived in that video expressed in MKS units is this quantity here. One may notice that this action isn't just Lorentz invariant. It also has a global U1 symmetry. Specifically, if we transform psi to this exponential times psi, which of course just implies this relation for psi bar, and plug it in up here, we see that for constant lambda, they just come across and cancel each other in both terms. So it's invariant under that transformation for arbitrary parameter value there where lambda is the parameter. Because the exponentials of successive transformations add, this constitutes a global U1 invariance. One might then ask the following question. What would happen if this was upgraded to a local U1 transformation, meaning lambda now depends on space-time? So lambda goes to lambda of x, where x just represents dependence on all the coordinates of space-time. The answer is that the Dirac Lagrangian isn't invariant under this more general transformation. This local version of the one it is invariant under, because this factor is a function of space-time and therefore cannot be commuted with the partial derivative. 
This term is still invariant, but this one isn't because of that partial derivative and this factor's dependence on space-time. The question then becomes, how does the action have to be changed to make it locally U1 invariant? The simplest answer to this question is to introduce a new four-vector field that transforms under this U1 gauge symmetry in whatever manner is required to cancel the term that destroys U1 gauge invariance in the original Dirac Lagrangian. So if we plug this in, this derivative catches on it, and we have to apply the product rule to this factor multiplying the psi field there. And so we get a term that represents a variation of the Lagrangian under this transformation. So the idea is just to add a gauge field in whose transformation under U1 is such that it also causes a new term to appear, but one that cancels the invariance term of this modified action with the a mu in it. It's actually quite a clever prescription. You'll see just how clever it is in a minute. Such a field is called a gauge field. Specifically, if one replaces the partial derivative with what is called a gauged covariant derivative here, where this a mu is that new gauge field that I've been talking about, and then take that a mu there to transform under u1 gauge transformations in this manner where this transformation law is consistent with the u1 label because successive transformations simply add to each other then one finds that the kinetic term is now locally u1 invariant so with this substitution and this transformation relation we find that this Lagrangian actually is locally U1 gauge invariant. One can see this simply by taking this transformation for the psi field, the Dirac field, and this transformation for the gauge field, and then plugging in the transformed versions into the gauged covariant derivatives. We see through all this algebra that I showed on the screen in detail to avoid confusion, just results in this transformation law. And because this transformation relation for psi bar follows from that, we simply have that this is actually invariant. So in fact, this little trick we did uh, in introducing this Lagrangian does actually succeed in making it locally U1 invariant. With this new U1 gauge invariant Dirac Lagrangian density established, it's hard not to notice the four vector field AMU required to make local invariance possible must have exactly the same gauge transformation property that the four vector potential in electrodynamics has under its own local U1 invariance. It is therefore natural to take the gauge field to be the electromagnetic field. In a previous video I showed how to derive the Maxwell Lagrangian density and it ended up having this value where F nu is given by this formula in terms of the electromagnetic four vector potential. The first term is called the kinetic term because it gives the dynamics of the electromagnetic field and then this is the interaction term because it gives its coupling to other fields. If one then takes the coupling between psi and a mu observed in this Lagrangian up here to be the interaction term and then just adds the Maxwell kinetic term for the photon field, where I call it the photon field because we've already identified the gauge field as the electromagnetic field, and of course the field quanta of that turn out to be photons. Perhaps that's a bit of a foreshadowing reference there, but still, whatever. Then one arrives at the following U1 gauge invariant Lagrangian density given here. This is gauge invariant. We've just figured out how to make this U1 gauge invariant. This Lagrangian density used as a quantum field theory for electromagnetism holds the distinction of having passed every experimental test yet performed. It is therefore taken as the correct Lagrangian density for quantum electrodynamics. It is by this process of upgrading the global U1 invariance of the Dirac Lagrangian density to its local version with a gauge field that is then taken to be the electromagnetic field that the quantum electrodynamics Lagrangian density is usually derived. Where the gauge field is taken to be the electromagnetic field as a result of its identical gauge transformation properties, then of course its verification as the proper action of quantum electrodynamics is empirical, as is always ultimately the case in physics and any other inherently empirical science. 
if we plug in the value for the covariant derivative d mu and then expand out the Lagrangian density, we find this form for it. We identify the Dirac Lagrangian right here. And then we see what appears to be the Maxwell Lagrangian here. If we do as we said, and we take the coupling term to be the interaction term shown here. So that gives us that L Maxwell for the quantum electrodynamics case just has this value. The interaction Lagrangian just has this value. And that's consistent with the original, more general version of the Maxwell Lagrangian that was given above. If we take the current, the four current density to have this value in terms of Dirac spinners. So that is how you derive the quantum electrodynamics Lagrangian density. So now that you've seen the mathematical details of actually deriving the Maxwell Lagrangian density, I hope you have a better appreciation for exactly where that peculiar and extremely important and also extremely elegant and beautiful Lagrangian density comes from. You see it all over in physics. It's an extremely famous theory because of its experimental success. And I hope that this video helps you have a clearer picture as to where that particular Lagrangian density comes from. It's worth knowing given its importance. Dietrich out.